Already by June 1915, the British minister in Panama learned that de Kesne was working for German intelligence. One of the places he was staying in, in a Brazilian port, was surrounded by British agents, but he escaped over the rooftops. Once he was captured while planting a bomb on a ship, and while being rowed ashore in a small boat, he leaped overboard. His last bombing was in February 1916, when he consigned what he claimed was his trunk of motion picture film and 16 boxes of supposedly minerals to be shipped to the United States from Brazil on the British ship Tennyson. There was a large explosion and fire at sea halfway to Trinidad. The captain managed to beach the stricken ship, but three sailors were killed. The British began a manhunt for de Kesne on a mandatory death sentence charge. British circles in Brazil were shocked to discover that Pete Nacard was a German agent. Fritz took off for Argentina, where he contracted with the National Board of Education to produce some educational films. He needed to get back to the United States to buy the film. To throw the British off the scent, he faked his death, planting a story in the April 27, 1916 New York Times that he had been killed by hostile Indians while leading an expedition in Bolivia. The Times then rang a long obituary. Apparently he quickly reconsidered, likely because he had only had an American passport, and under the Neutrality Act he would probably be immune to British prosecution. Seventeen days after the death notice, he got a fake story onto the AP wire, saying he had been victorious in the Bolivian battle and had been rescued, badly wounded by government troops. He arrived in New York uninjured in early May. Who killed Kitchener? Now we are less than a month away from de Kesne's greatest adventure, the assassination of British Supreme Military Commander Sir Herbert Kitchener on June 5, 1916. De Kesne's version is certainly flamboyant. Kitchener was a larger-than-life character who played a dominant role in his age. He became famous as Kitchener of Khartoum when he led the British forces in the Battle of Umberdurman in 1898 that effectively reconquered the Sudan and avenged the death of Major General Charles Gordon, who had been killed by the Mahdi's troops in Khartoum in 1884. He was the ruthless commander in South Africa in the Second Boer War, was made commander-in-chief in British India in 1902, made field marshal in 1909, and British consul general of Egypt in 1911. He was appointed Secretary of State for War at the outbreak of World War I in late 1914. His famous likeness, with the flaring moustaches, pointing at the viewer with a message, Once you join your country's army, God save the King, was one of the lasting symbols of the British war effort. Kitchener was among the first to see that the war would be a long one and a British industry had to be mobilised on a war footing for a long, prolonged period. But by mid-1915, with the war stalemated in the trenches of France and astronomical casualties expended to win a few yards of territory, he began to lapse into silence at staff meetings and was more and more at loggerheads with the civilian government of Prime Minister Asquith. Finally, the civilians decided to get him out of the way for a while by sending him on a mission to Russia, where there was fear that the Tsarist government would conclude a separate peace with Germany. Kitchener departed for Petrograd on the HMS Hampshire, on June 5, 1916, from Scarpa Flow, base of the main British fleet, 
in the Orkney Islands off the northeast tip of Scotland. And I'm going to put a photo here of the ship and also of Mr. Kitchener. At 7.30 p.m. during the night, a violent storm came and there was also a massive explosion and the ship sank within 15 minutes. The lifeboats could not be lowered in the storm. A few large rubber rafts were deployed, but of those that made it to the, to the coast, they found a steep cliff and the refugees could not ascend. Only 12 of the 655 persons on board survived. Fritz de Kesne's version of this story had the makings of a pulp thriller. He said that during the 12 days between the report of his death in Bolivia and his supposed rescue, he went to the Netherlands where a Boer revolutionary committee working with the German intelligence gave him commission as a colonel. The Germans had learned that a Russian nobleman, Count Boris Zakrevsky, had been assigned to go to England to accompany Kitchener's party to Petrograd. The Count was kidnapped on route by the Germans and his papers forwarded to the Boers with orders that Fritz de Kessner was to impersonate Zakrevsky and to find a way to assassinate Kitchener. Wood's account has Fritz being fluent in Russian, which was not the case, although in Fritz's telling, Zakrevsky was supposed to speak good English. Fritz, dressed up as a Russian officer, is supposed to have met Kitchener in London, accompanied him and his entourage, entourage to Britain's main naval base at Scarpa Flow in the Orkney Islands, north of Scotland, and from there sailed with Kitchener on the Hampshire. Fritz said he dropped self-igniting water torches out his porthole to identify Kitchener's ship to waiting German U-boats. One of these fired the fatal torpedo. At the last minute, Fritz leaped over the side into a raft in the raging storm and managed to navigate 100 yards to the waiting submarine. He says he was taken to Germany, where he was secretly awarded the Iron Cross, as well as a medal from the Turkish government, and made Baron of Brandenburg. Art Ronnie's search uncovered no confirmation of these wards, but many German records were destroyed at the end of the war. During one of Fritz's later arrests, a photograph was found among his effects in which he is wearing the Iron Cross and medals from Austria, Turkey and Bulgaria. Artroni is sceptical that these were really awarded and not purchased somewhere. De Kessne is supposed to have returned to the United States aboard the German submarine Deutschland, arriving in Baltimore on July 10, 1916. The official British account had that the Hampshire striking a mine laid that morning by the German submarine U-75 commanded by Kurt Bateson. There were several other candidates for Kitchener's death. Lord Alfred Douglas, ill-starred lover of Oscar Wilde, said the Jews did it and that they bribed Winston Churchill as well to represent events in the Battle of Jutland which took place just before the sinking of the Hampshire to the benefit of a New York Jewish financier. Churchill sued for libel and Lord Douglas served six months in prison. Irish Republicans were said to have planted bombs in the hold and General Lindendorf joined head with Hindenburg of Germany's armed forces in World War I said it was Russian communists who gave the Germans Kitchener's travel plans. Fritz did appear in New York briefly in May 1916, before the sinking of the Hampshire. Using the name Frederick Fredericks, he bought $24,000 worth of film with the money he had been given in Argentina and stored it in the Brooklyn warehouse. Two weeks later, 
the warehouse went up in a fiery explosion and the film was destroyed. Alice Wortley filed an insurance claim for $33,000 in Frederick's name with the company that held the policy. She also filed an $80,000 claim on behalf of a supposed George Fordham with another company which had issued the policy on the film that had gone down on the Tennyson, the ship that the Kesney himself had blown up. Fritz was not seen again until July 1917 when he, when he turned up in Washington DC. He moved on to New York where he thought it was best to become invisible as usual by exuberant public display of himself in disguise. World War I was at its height. The United States had entered the war in April. Fritz designed for himself the uniform of an imaginary Australian officer and complete with swagger stick presented himself at the offices of a National Speakers Bureau as the supposed Captain Claude Stoughton of the also imaginary West Australia Light Horse. He claimed an amazing war record. Stoughton had fought on the British side in the Boer War, in France and Flanders on the continent early in World War I, then in the invasion of Gallipoli in the Turkish Dardanelles, not to mention New Guinea. Wounded many times, he was a veteran of every famous Battle of the War America had just joined. He proved to be a sensation on a national speaking tour. He was even introduced to George H. Reid, former High Commissioner of Australia, who did not suspect the impersonation. Captain Stoughton even included some tips for the elucid elucidation of his audiences on how the German spy system worked. A method actor, the Cassinet for the time being, put aside supporting the Germans and energetically sold American war bonds. The defrauded insurance companies were still trying to find out who Frederick Fredericks and George Fordham were. They had a good idea it was the Cassinet, as his wife Alice was the only identifiable figure involved in filing the insurance claims and as one of these involved an arson explosion at a Brooklyn warehouse it put Thomas B. Brophy who was New York's chief fire marshal and Thomas J. Tunney the head of the bomb squad which had just been co-opted into the military onto Kessner's trail. They got a lead when C Captain Claude Stoughton incautiously made a few pro-German comments to a woman who reported him to the FBI from a set of mug shots, she identified Stoughton as de Kessner. On December 7, 1917, detectives from the bomb squad raided Fritz's Manhattan apartment and took him into custody. They found extensive newspaper clippings on all the ship bombings in South America, the invoice for the shipment aboard the Tennyson, and a letter of commendation from the Austri Austrian High Commissioner in Nicaragua. Fritz was charged with two counts of insurance fraud, both following suspicious explosions. Britain filed for extradition for murder. Fritz's first gambit was to feign insanity. He mussed his hair and began babbling. An insanity hearing was held in May 1918. There were two prominent psychiatrists, a prison doctor, a lawyer and other officials in attendance. Fritz broke away from his guards and ran in screaming, Bring up the guns! Bring up the guns! I want you men to watch the enemy! Two of the medical men agreed that Kessner was insane. The third said that he had suffered a psychotic break but was recovering and partly faking. They all agreed that he could not be tried at that time. He was committed to the Marawa, Marawan State Hospital for the Insane. Allison now divorced him. 
He lasted there for five months when he found his fellow inmates unbearable and suddenly had a complete recovery. He asked for a new hearing where he pled guilty to attempting to defraud the Sturveyant Insurance Company, the one with the policy on the Brooklyn warehouse. He did not plead on the other company, which involved a charge of blowing up the Tennyson. The British charges still had priority over a mere insurance fraud, and a deportation hearing was held on December 23, 1918. In the middle of the proceedings, Fritz collapsed, insisting that he was paralysed from the waist down. Carried to prison on a stretcher, he told the guards, I don't see why I should stay here long. There's nothing can keep me here. Several doctors examined him. They stuck needles in his legs and under his toenails. Fritz never flinched. They finally agreed that he really was paralysed. He was sent to the prison ward at Bellevue Hospital. Someone slipped him a pair of hacksaw blades and for five months he spent his days in a wheelchair pretending to be bird watching while quietly soaring away at the heavy iron bars. At a new hearing on May 19, 1919, his deportation to England was approved. On the 26th, just after midnight, he broke out two window bars, fell to the ground from the second story window and staggered away into the night. No one helped him. He was scheduled to be sent to England to face murder charges later that morning. This time he stayed at liberty for 13 years. He sent a friend a press release saying that he had been rescued from the Bellevue by his cousin, Count Francois de Racongre, who had driven him to Mexico City. He actually went to Boston, where he started an advertising business under the name Frank de Trafford Craven. The New York police issued a wanted a wanted for murder poster for Duquesne. He later claimed that he briefly took a job as a Boston policeman during a police strike, which gave him a chance to destroy the file on him at Boston Police Headquarters. For years, he regularly had friends from all over the world send postcards and telegrams to the New York Police reading, Come and get me, signed Fritz. In 1926, Fritz, as Frank de Trafford Craven, went to work for Joseph P. Kennedy, JFK's wealthy father, who was getting into the silent movie business with a company called Film Booking Officers of America. As part of this job, Fritz daringly moved back to Manhattan, where he was well known under his real name. In 1928, Kennedy along with David Sarnoff, founded RKO Pictures. Fritz de Kesne went along as part of the publicity staff. In 1930, he switched to the Quigley Publishing Company, which put out a string of movie magazines. He gave himself a military title and called himself Major Craven. He lived well, often told his war stories, including how he blew up English ships in South America during the Great War. On May 23, 1932, the alien squad caught up with him and he was arrested in the Quigley building. Fritz insisted he was Frank Craven and it was a case of mistaken identity. They took him away at gunpoint. The book, The Man Who C Killed Kitchener, had just been published, so the police called Clement Wood down to the station and showed him their prisoner. Wood, who had met, met the Kesne twice in 1927 in Port-au-Prince and just the year before in Martinique, insisted it was not this the Kesne, but he had known Major Craven for five years, that is, since 1927. 
this testimony could be seen as suspect. Fritz was booked for homicide and for being an escaped prisoner. He was defended by Arthur Garfield Hayes, who had been one of the attorneys for Sacco and Vanzetti, the Scottsboro Boys, and John Scopes in the famous Monkey Trial. By this time, Britain did not want to pursue wartime crimes and withdrew the charges. He was re-arrested on the escape charge, but a judge threw it out. Fritz de Kesne was a free man. Working for Germany again. Fritz de Kesne, despite long periods where he was more than a newspaper man or publicity agent, was at heart an adventurer and an anti-British spy. In his youth, that had meant working for Germany. It was a pattern that led to his final undoing. In the spring of 1934, he secretly accepted the job of intelligence officer for the Order of 76, an American pro-Nazi organization, which was then in merger negotiations with William Dudley Pally's silver shirts. That October, the secret was ferreted out by John Spivak, a writer for the left-wing New Masses. Spivak enlisted the Kesne's Jewish then-girlfriend to keep him informed of the spy's activities. From here on, Fritz's career is beyond the cut-off date for the Clement Woods adulatory biography. Arturoni gives no details of what de Kesne did as intelligence officer for this group, and de Kesne appears to have left them to take a job with the government's Works Progress Administration in January 1935. In Ronnie's opinion, there is no indication that de Kesne held anti-Semitic views, but he saw the pro-German organisations as being anti-British. Despite its ramifications, it was quite simply just a job to the immoral and the opportunistic Fritz de Kesne. The American fascists were incompetent small fry. Fritz was soon to be drawn into the real thing. In 1935, Admiral Willem Canaris became head of the Abwehr, Germany's division of military intelligence. One of his goals was to establish a network of spies in the United States. He chose for this mission Colonel Nicholas Ritter, a man who had lived in the United States for 13 years, where he worked in weaving factories and was married to an American woman. Ritter had returned to Germany in 1936, was assigned to Abwehr the next year, and sent back to America in October 1937. Canaris instructed him to make contact with Fritz de Kesne, who he knew of from his work in South America in the last war. Ritter travelled under his own name, but then went underground using the name Alfred Landing. He made Germany's most serious inroads into America's secrets in meetings with other men before he got around to de Kesne. Ritter's greatest coup was to get the plans for the Northern bomb site. In its day, the most accurate device known for high altitude bombing. He got these from Hermann Lang, a naturalized German who had participated with Hitler in the Munich Beer Hall Putsch of 1923 and now worked for the Karl L. Norden Company. Ritter hit the plans in the wooden casing for an umbrella and on January 9, 1938 personally handed the umbrella off to a German steward and secret courier on the ship Reliance, which was bound for Bremen. Arturonic calls this probably the greatest espionage coup during that tenuous time before the war, comparable only to the Americans breaking the German and Japanese codes. 
The only other significant intelligence Ritter Spiring acquired came from Everett Minister Ruder, an engineer and designer at the Sperry Gyroscope Company. Art Ronnie lists Ruder's thefts to include the blueprints of the complete radio instrumentation of the new Glen Martin bomber and among the Speddy developments classified drawings of rangefinders, blind flying instruments, a bank and turn indicator, a navigator compass, a wiring diagram of the Lockheed Hudson bomber and diagrams of the Hudson gun mountings. Ritter had become friends with Fritz de Kessner. Probably because of Fritz's previous notoriety, the Ritter operation, after its members were arrested, became known as the de Kessner spy ring. This was very far from the truth. From its inception at the end of 1937, Ritter's agents in various American cities each acted alone. None, for security reasons, having information on any of the others. This changed when the Gestapo recruited German-born, naturalized American citizen William Siebold while he was on a visit to the homeland. They blackmailed Siebold into becoming a spy, using threats to his family and unearthing an old police record in Germany that could endanger his American citizenship. They sent him back to the US under the name Harry Sawyer to consolidate and expand the Ritter Ring. He arrived in New York on February 8, 1940. In retrospect, it seemed stupid of the Gestapo to entrust such a sensitive mission to an unwilling draftee. Seabold, before he even left Germany, on some pretext, visited the American consulate in Cologne and told them the whole plan. When he arrived in the United States, the first thing he did was to contact the FBI, who actually had an agent move in with him for the first eight weeks. Now Harry Sawyer set up the meeting with a few existing agents whose names he began with. He was tasked with setting up a clandestine shortwave radio to beam his discoveries to Hamburg. The FBI rented a house out on Long Island and set up a transmitter staffed by German-speaking FBI agents. Sawyer, as he was known, told his pro-German confederates that he was himself the radio operator and no one ever checked. The station transmitted heavily redacted versions of whatever the spies produced, leaving in enough genuine but harmless information to make the operation seem legitimate. Photographs and materials with tables and charts that could not be transmitted by Morse code were entrusted to shipboard couriers, cooks, seamen and stewards. Harry Sawyer rented a two-room office in Manhattan. One of the rooms was soundproofed and used by the FBI to monitor a microphone bug and to run a 16mm motion picture camera pointed through a one-way mirror. Compared to the real damage done by Hermann Lang and Everett Ruder, Fritz de Kessner's assignments seemed like science fiction. The Abwehr sent with Seabolt a microfiche listing 18 tasks for him. He was to find out if AT&T had invented a secret ray to guide bombs to their targets. Also, did the Army have a uniform that would repel mustard gas? Did the US have anti-aircraft shells guided by electric eyes? Had the US developed a way to conduct bacteriological warfare from aeroplanes? Did the US Army have a trench crusher machine that could flatten the trench by driving over it? More prosaically, Fritz was to tell the Germans if the United States military began large-scale mobilization something they could read about in the newspapers. And they gave him a list of 23 aircraft and plane engine manufacturers from around the country and told them to get information on everything they produced. Fritz had by now promoted himself to Colonel de Kessner. 
threats to justify his pay, sent voluminous information through Sawyer on flight, flight training schools, sailing dates for ships going to England and the American defence establishment. The Abwehr responded, tell the Kesne that we are not interested in information that has been published several weeks ago in the New York Times and the Herald Tribune. He wrote to the aircraft companies pretending to be a patriotic researcher, asking about their facilities and model line, forwarding to the Germans the stuff he got back in the mail. His one piece of valuable news was he somehow got hold of the information that Washington was releasing the plans for the Northern Bomb site to Britain, and he sometimes found out where the Navy battle groups were headed. Except for Lang and Rutter, he was producing better stuff than most of the younger, inexperienced agents. Fritz, ever cautious, had met with Sawyer 20 times but had always refused to come to the bugged office. Finally, on June 25, 1941, he agreed to a meeting there where the FBI got him on film. Four days later, the feds closed the net rounding up 19 agents in New York and four in New Jersey. The total would run to 33 by the time they went to trial. It was billed by the press as the greatest spy roundup in US history. 93 FBI agents worked on the case. Fritz was taken in his apartment by a man who had rented the unit downstairs and pretended to be a friend, who now showed up with two other FBI agents. J. Edgar Hoover branded the Kesne the most important of the defendants. The initial 24 were tried as a group. 10 pled guilty, leaving 14 to go to trial. Fritz was the first defendant to take to the stand in the six week trial that began in September. He mesmerised the jury and the audience with a dramatic and often fantastic recounting of his life story, from the days of the Boer War through his many escapes. He claimed he had been an observer for, the, for South Africa in the Russo-Japanese War and had spent 10 months in a Brussels hospital for shell, shell shock. He said he could visit the Theodore Roosevelt in the White House at any time he liked and that he had been there three or four times in one week. He retold how he had killed Field Marshal Kitchener and said he had been rescued from Bellevue Hospital by members of the Irish Republican Army. He denied, probably truthfully, that he had ever met any of the other defendants except Seabolt. He said he thought Seabolt was insane because he paid good money for junk. Junk information the Kesne had clipped from the newspapers. I sold him a code used by Benedict Arnold in the war between England and the, and the United States in 1776, for example. Despite the presentation of voluminous evidence of materials he had supplied Seabolt for transmission to Germany, he has insisted that he was not a spy. Unhappily for the defendants, their attorney summations were scheduled to begin on December 8, 1941. Pearl Harbor took place the day before. The jury took only eight hours to reach verdicts on all 24 defendants. The sentences ranged from as little as 15 months to 18 years. Herman Lang, purveyor of the Northern Bombsite, and Fritz got 18 years. Everett Ruder was one of the four who received 16 years. Most got between 5 and 10 years. Colonel Nicholas Ritter became the commander of, the, of a Luftwaffe Panzer Division, then an American POW, and after the war a businessman in Hamburg. He died in 1974. Admiral Canaris, while running the Nazis' principal military intelligence service, secretly plotted against Hitler, at one point proposing to have him declared insane and committed to an asylum. 
He opposed the Holocaust, recruited many Jews into the Abwehr, solely to get them credentials that would get them safely in Spain. He arranged for the escape of the Luba Victor Rabbi Yosef Schneeron from Warsaw, from which the Shabbat movement had declared him a righteous Gentile. He was executed by the Nazis just as the war was ending, for having connections to the attempt to assassinate Hitler. William Siebold was provided with a new identity and started a chicken farm in California. Fritz served the longest of any of the defendants. Hermann Lang was deported to Germany in September 1950. All but three of the others had completed their sentences or been paroled by 1950, and the last besides Fritz was freed in 1951. He served 12 years, 7 months and 16 days, five years of which were in solitary confinement. In his last months in jail, he filed one last appeal, claiming that when the FBI had arrested him, they had seized a bag of uncut diamonds worth three million dollars and the map to the long hidden Kruger gold. He was released on September 19, 1954 and he was 77. His health had deteriorated greatly. He fell frequently, was partly deaf, had a dislocated shoulder that was not treated and set badly and was thought to have dementia. He had had a stroke that had left him partly par paralyzed. He returned to New York where a few old friends met him. The city's welfare department placed him in a nursing home. On December 21, 1955, he was welcomed back to the Adventurers Club for a dinner and talk at the Hotel Del Monico. Some members refused to attend, denouncing him as a traitor, but others wanted to hear one of the last of the founders. His famous voice was almost gone, but he regaled with them the old stories, real and imaginary. The Boer War, his escape from Bermuda, Captain, Captain Claude Stoughton, sabotage in South America, how he killed Kitchener and his long years in prison. He died of a stroke on May 24, 1956, at the age of 78. Hero, fool, madman, villain. He was all of these.